Hello again, everyone. Ariel Hawani here for another edition of Ariel Hawani Meets. Prior to Money in the Bank in Las Vegas, we spoke to the great Natalia Neidhart about her upcoming match against Ronda Rousey. Now we get a chance to talk about your legendary career. A three-generation wrestler from the greatest family in the history of wrestling, from the great country of Canada, from Calgary, <laughs> Alberta, Canada. Uh, I mean, the Hart family is so special, and there is such uh, an amount, I, I think, a great amount of pressure to be a member of the family to be yeah. in this business mm -hmm. and at this juncture correct me if i'm wrong you're pretty much on, on on this type of stage platform you're the only one right now is that fair right now in wwe yes yes yeah. on this type of platform right. this high what kind of pressure comes with that to keep you know the torch alive keep the baton for the next generation to come but for right now you're the only one running that right. race so to speak it's a lot of pressure it always has been um because i've never taken for granted like i've our family we're, we have a lot of pride and like you know people accuse brett sometimes of being he's too serious right. he takes it too seriously like to, to be brett hart you have to take everything very very seriously um because he was the best and he he treated he treated being a professional wrestler and especially being the champion, he treated it like it was very, very, very real. And that's why he's he's so good. Um, for me, I always just felt so much pressure. You're following in the footsteps of Stu Hart, um, Brett the Hitman Hart, Owen Hart, Davy Boy Smith, Dynamite Kid, and of course my dad. Um, it, I was always like, I'm never gonna be as good. When I first started, I, I had tons of pressure because I, I felt like I was never gonna fill their shoes and then I came to the realization, and this is what I told Charlotte Flair when I first met her, I was like, you don't have to worry about filling their shoes, you're a woman. You're just gonna blaze your own beautiful trail. And you can always pay tribute to, to our, you know, we can always pay tribute to our families, but it's really, really cool to blaze your own trail and do your own thing. And you can never really truly compare to them 100% because we're women. We're, we're in a whole other stratosphere in a great way. Uh, recently, we've seen some uh, sons, daughters come to WWE. I think of Braun Breaker. Yeah. Doesn't use the Steiner name. Uh, a lot was made of The Rock's daughter not using his name. Uh, you have used the Neidhart name. Like, it's very clear that you're from the Hart family and whatnot. Was there ever any consideration to not acknowledge any of that? Like, to just make you Natalia and not acknowledge that you're a Neidhart or from the Hart family when you first came to WWE? Not really, no. It's funny because I've heard that with a few other people. Even with, with Charlotte, I remember her saying, they don't want me doing the chops, they don't want me doing the woos, they don't want me doing the figure four. That, that was when I first met her. Um, and I was like, don't worry, everything in WWE can change hourly. So like, what I find always brings people the most success, especially in WWE, is what's the most authentic, what feels the most real, what's the most natural, what is going to connect you the most with the audience emotionally. If your dad is Ric Flair, own it. Yes. I mean, there's nothing you can do but just own it. To, to try to skirt around it is crazy. Um, the same with the Samoans. You look at the, the Usos and Roman and Tamina and, and now with, with the Rock's daughter and Simone, and, and um, that's her real name, like they're they're just gonna, they're always gonna be part of that Samoan dynasty. There will be no way around it. Um, whether they give Simone a, you know, an off the beaten path character or, or they have her as a totally different name, they're gonna try and experiment with different things, but in her heart is always gonna be that Samoan dynasty, that, that you know, her, her family lineage will, will run deep. And for me, that's always been like, I'm so, so proud of my family, but I also, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with embracing it. Why fix something that's not broken? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm so grateful that I've had the sharpshooter my entire career as like my finishing move because it's got such a deep, deep meaning behind it. Um, so many of the greatest, you know, pro wrestlers of all time, greatest entertainers of all time have used that, that, that submission, whether it was The Rock, whether it was Trish Stratus, of course, Brett, you know, making it famous. For me to have it, it's just been like, it's been amazing. And it's, it's been like a, it's been a, a huge secret weapon in my career to, to keeping my matches exciting and entertaining. The, the girls that have the submissions, they, they make matches really, really exciting. What's interesting about your career is that uh, you've now been doing this professionally for around, I guess, a little over two decades, right? Yep. Um, and when you entered the business and it seemed like you were gonna make this into a career, it was during a period where you know a lot of bad things happened to your family, right? right. Shortly after Owen's passing, um, you know, Montreal screw job is a couple of years prior, Brett's injury and whatnot. And there's just maybe, uh, I thought maybe a feeling that like, wow, are, are the hearts 
going to stop loving wrestling or being involved in wrestling. Like, I don't think anyone would have blamed the yeah. family. And yet you entered at that point. Yeah. Was there ever a period where like, I want nothing to do with this because of all these bad things that have happened to my family? There's been a lot of tragedies in our family. <clears throat> like my uncle Davey was 38 when he died. Um, he had a broken back. A lot of people don't know that about Davey, but Davey like broke his back when he was wrestling in WCW. So he, he spent a lot of the last few years of his career, he, he was working through like a broken back. Um, but he had wrestled since he was 15. It was the only thing that he knew and it was the only thing that he loved. So he continued to work through that, but in order to work through that, that pain came a price. Um, that was really hard watching him go through that, watching his family go through that. My uncle Brett, um, you know, when he had a, when he had that stroke, he was paralyzed for like three months. He couldn't even like do this with his hand. He couldn't even wink. He couldn't wink. He, uh, you know, we see Brett now and we, we, we go, okay, he's fine. But for, th for three months after his stroke, it was very, very critical. Um, it was really, really bad. Like he had a, he had a lot of issues really recovering from that. Um, and it's stuff that he still deals with. And then of course, with Owen passing away, um, I had mentioned on Corey Graves podcast the other day, it was just Owen's passing just affected our family so much, like our entire family. Of course, undoubtedly, you know, the, the people that it affected the most, you know, his wife, his children, but our family just, in some ways, our family never recovered from that. My grandmother never got over it. She died a few years after. Um, my grandfather died of a broken heart after my grandmother passed away. Um, my grandparents were just devastated. My dad was confused. He didn't know what to do. They didn't know like whether, like, I think sometimes my dad had guilt about still doing it, you know, but we need to be wrestling because that's how, that's what we love. That's what we, that's how we pay our bills. This is our passion. This is all we've ever known. But how do we go on when something so tragic like this happens? Are we insensitive for going on? Are we, does this make us, you know, and so that's the thing is that like there was a lot of guilt within the family and a lot of different emotions. When something traumatic like that happens, if there's no playbook on how to handle people's emotions. You, there's no playbook on trauma. Everybody deals with it differently. For me, I just kind of, caught the wrestling bug when my, my family asked me to come and train in the dungeon. Um, they were filming a show called Matt Rats with Eric Bischoff and they asked me to host the show and I was doing acting and theater and, and in high school and I had just graduated high school and I was like, yeah, I'd love to host the show. That'd be so much fun. Long story short, my cousins, Teddy Hart and Harry Smith and then now my husband, TJ, they started training me how to like wrestle in the dungeon. From my very first day in the dungeon, I was just hooked. And the dungeon, you know, if anyone doesn't know what the dungeon is, it's like the holy grail for pro wrestling. It's a little room in, a, in the hard house. And there's holes in the ceiling from people's heads that have gone through it. There's just one little window. And uh, right next to the dungeon's a crematorium wow. because the house used to be a hospital in the First World War. So it's just this really, really crazy, cool place that we all learned how to, to, to do what we love. But I was hooked. From the very first time I started, I was hooked. By the way, is that house still around? Yep. Who, yeah. Who owns it or lives in it? Uh, a really nice family lives in it now. I actually, so not your family, right? No, okay. not our family. Right. Um, but they, the city of Calgary has deemed it a historical site. So I actually went back in there. My cousin Tanya had passed away um, a few months ago. I'm sorry. Very tragically. And thank you. We went... Um, I went back to Calgary for her funeral and I drove past the Hart House because I always do that when I'm in Calgary. I always have to drive past the house. And then the people that owned it were there and they let me come in. Wow. And I went into the house and I was like, oh my God, this is like, I could just go to every room and like, you know, just my childhood just flashed right, you know, cause I grew up there. Um, and then our names were on the brick. We all as kids wrote our names on the brick on the outside of the house. That was, those names were still there. That is amazing. It You're giving so me cool. goosebumps. Yeah, it was just, mad. Was, the house is just like, it's my whole childhood in that house. Uh, could I ask, what, what did you think of, uh, you know, seeing Martha Hart return to television and, and, you know, that whole tournament and seeing, you know, Owen's legacy honored that way? What did you what I'm did so you glad that you asked that because I've been like, it's been so hard because I work for WWE, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for Martha. Like, I really do. Like, I think that she did such a beautiful job. She, she carries herself so well. She, so, she was so poised. It was the first time that fans really got a chance to like see her. 
And I thought she really, she just held herself so well and her kids just seem like such nice kids. I do speak, you know, message, um, communicate with her son, Oj, every so often. And she just, um, she held herself so well. I thought they did a really nice job honoring Owen and that's the way Martha wanted to honor him. And I respect that so much because nobody can understand or imagine what she went through. I always try to put myself, no matter what, I always, always try to put myself in her shoes when that incident happened. What would it be like if I got that phone call about TJ? What would it be like trying to explain to my little children that they're not gonna have a dad again? You know, so it's like, I um, totally, totally understand why, any way that she feels, I think she's totally justified. Not everybody has to agree with it, but I do respect her. And I think that she did a beautiful job. And I think they did a really nice job honoring him the way that she wanted him honored. And that was her call, and it always should be her call. Could I ask, did you have a favorite Owen memory? I think you were around 17 or so when he passed. Um, so you, you were, you know, a teenager. Do you have a favorite interaction memory story with him? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few. Um, my first fight with my husband actually stemmed from, because um, TJ grew up around our family, and he, he's been around our family since he was 10 years old, but Owen, asked TJ to be his guest at WrestleMania. And I remember like Which being one? so, oh, I, can't, the, I think it was the one with Brett and uh, Shawn Michaels. Okay. So I, I'm, but don't, TJ would know. I would, I would have to ask TJ, he's like a wrestling historian. So, so Owen asked TJ to be his guest and I remember being so jealous and so pissed off. And I, looking back, it was such a generous, generous thing for Owen to do because TJ, you know, no, TJ doesn't ever share this, but TJ, never met his dad. He grew up in a, you know, with a single mom and, you know, they were very, they struggled. They lived, you know, at women's shelters. They, they didn't have a lot of money. They like, you know, TJ's mom was trying to work all these odd, you know, odd jobs to, to kind of hold down for it. Sometimes they didn't have enough food. Like our family really took TJ in and Owen was one of those people that really like took TJ under his wing. Owen and my uncle Davey really took TJ under their wing and Owen flew this young kid first class to WrestleMania. This is a kid that sometimes didn't have enough money to buy shoes for school. You know, would open up his fridge and not have any food to eat. They were, you know, TJ was so thin and so, you know, they, he was just poor growing up. Imagine Owen Hart buying you a first class ticket to be his guest at WrestleMania. It's just those things that it's like, Owen would never know what TJ would become in WWE, but TJ fought through so many things because of a moment like that of somebody like Owen Hart believing in him. So to me, like, when I think about the, all the memories that I can share, that, that's one of my, my favorite memories because he didn't have to do that for a kid that he didn't owe anything to. Thank you for sharing that. Um, speaking of memories, you, you posted something on Instagram recently uh, about your father, the late, great Jim the Anvil Neidhart, absolute legend, one half of the greatest tag team of all time. And uh, it was about, uh, him, in one of his multiple times you said that he was uh, fired from WWE, he started his own <laughs> school uh, in your backyard. Could you tell us about that? Because I think that that was maybe part of your introduction as well to the business. I mean, obviously he was your dad, but it seems like an incredible story. Like he set up a ring in your backyard and started to teach people. <laughs> and what was it, Anvil Promotions or something Anvil like that? Anvil Promotions. What, what went on there and how long did Anvil Promotions actually last? It didn't last long. Okay. Um, I think Brett got my dad a job again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, I laugh about it now. I, it's funny because my dad and I had such a strong connection because we both do this. We both love wrestling. We both have competed in WWE. It's like that special, special bond that we've had. But my dad, you know, growing up, he really, really struggled a lot. And it's not something that he ever shared. Um, you know, it's something that like, he was very private about his struggles. And um, I think now it's so, like I never feel bad about talking about my dad's struggles because I think it's so important, especially right now to talk about mental health. My dad, you know, was this big burly athlete that struggled with you know, anxiety and depression and all sorts of things. So he had demons. He, he lost his job a lot in WWE, probably five times. And I always remember like my dad being like let go. And it was always like this traumatic event when my dad would lose his job, we would get scared. What were we gonna do? What were we gonna do for money? This was a thing as kids. So when my dad, 
you know, would lose his job, it was always really hard on us as kids. Um, it made me have a different drive that I have now in WWE that I just always strive for perfection because I never wanted to like be fired like my dad. So it really like drove home this like, I gotta be perfect at all times. Hence sometimes being like a company girl and being pigeoned into that role because I just was always striving to please everyone. But when my dad lost his job, he, he, he started up Anvil Promotions and he started this like school. There was a wrestling school and then he turned it into like a promotion where he would run shows. So we had a ring in our backyard and like my dad was just, I mean, the truth of the matter is, and again, I, I laugh about it now, but we were just trying to make ends meet. You know, we were, my dad was just trying to pay bills. So he was like, well, if we, we have people that sign on that want to pay us to like be trained by me, I can train them in the backyard. Because when you look at it, my dad didn't have any other skills. When you can't, when he couldn't wrestle in WWE, the independent scene was few and far between, not enough to feed a family of three and to take care of the lifestyle that we had. And, um, you know, my dad couldn't go work and be a car salesman. Everybody would recognize Jim the Anvil Neidhart selling a car. He couldn't go work at FedEx. He couldn't, he could, but he didn't, he wasn't able to. He, he couldn't wrap his head around doing that because, you know, he, he had too much pride. So he started that school. And Roderick Strong actually was one of the students. Wow. Yeah, Roderick Strong and his dad were, were students and my mom would make them lunch in the kitchen and they would swim in our pool and my dad would like <laughs> teach everybody all these like, you imagine Jim Neidhart going, I'll teach you how to wrestle and then body slamming you really hard. It's like, yeah, Jim's body slamming all of us. We're all like in back races. <laughs> but then he had that promotion and, he, and uh, that school in the backyard and he tried really, really hard with it. But, you know, we were so lucky to have Brett and Owen and Davey always trying to get my dad his job back. And so Brett, I think it, the promotion didn't last long. They, my dad didn't make much money off of it at all, but he tried. And thankfully he got his job back. <laughs> I recently stumbled upon a clip. I think it was from 2014 or 2015. It's from Total Divas and uh, you're having dinner with Brett and his wife. I don't know if you know the clip that I'm talking about. And you're talking about your dad uh, and you're saying like, you know, he, as you said, he was going through some stuff yeah. and uh, you just, you need to, you know, kind of let him be. Like you can't, you, 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 you You've, you've suffered a lot, you've struggled, you know, it's been tough, and you just, it's, you're, you're telling Brett that like, you, you have to like, live your own life, right? And yeah. you seemed a little bit frustrated. Do you remember this, you're having yeah. dinner, um, and I know he passed in 2018, right. so that's several years later. By the time he passed, like, were you guys in a good place? Did, did you feel like you had reached a point where you were comfortable with the relationship where you didn't have to put everything that he was going through on, on your shoulders and you can have like a, a healthy father-daughter relationship? Yeah, I, I <laughs> um, you know, with my dad, uh, that's what actually probably why I, to this day I don't have kids because my dad was kind of like my kid. Mm -hmm. I was super close to my dad. We were like, we, we were very, very close. Probably the closest of my sisters to him because we had that connection with wrestling, but I also really understood my dad. I, I, have, like, I have a similar personality to him. We, we, have, we're very, we were very similar. Um, but my dad just couldn't, there were so many times that he just couldn't get it on track and stay on track. And so my dad would rely on my mom and my sisters and I to always just be like protecting him and keeping him safe and just guiding him along because he just, he really struggled. He struggled a lot with anxiety and depression and addiction. And, um, you know, in the past we would always be careful about talking about it because we never would want to make my dad look bad or expose him in a bad light. But now I realize it's not a bad light at all. So many people are going through stuff like that. And it, it's not a, like, I heard somebody say this the other day, addiction is not linear. It's like my dad would do great, he'd be on track, and then he'd fall off the wagon. We'd get him back on track, he would do great, he would stay great, and then he'd fall. It was a lifelong thing since I was a child. It was a lifelong thing, and my, that's why my dad was in and out of WWE so much. I also think it's kind of why Brett, it launched Brett onto his own path because there were times that they just couldn't count on my dad anymore, like to not, you know, is Jim gonna miss a flight? Is Jim gonna show up? Is Jim gonna be there? Is, like, there, there came a point where like Brett just kind of had to go, go on his own. And, and that was cool because we ended up seeing the, the rise of one of the greatest pro wrestlers that ever has lived. But for me, I was just always trying to save my dad. And I think that I realized that I couldn't save him. I can't save, I can't, I can't do it all. I can't do it all on my own. And luckily WWE like has helped me so much, especially while I've been working with them. They've helped me so much through their programs that they have. They've helped me so much like get my dad on track. There's been many times that WWE has saved my dad's life. 
that for me at that point in my career, I wouldn't have had the money or the energy to like, they set up all the resources to help me do that. Um, but it wasn't easy because I was kind of doing it on my own. Like my dad would only listen to me. So I was like the driving force to get him into treatment. I was like, and, and then sometimes it would make our relationship really rocky because my dad would be mad at me because I was the one like forcing him to get help. But I don't regret any of that because it really made us stronger. My dad knew how much I loved him. Um, he knew I was trying to save his life. And then the last year of his life, um, dealing with Alzheimer's, he was like the most at peace. That last year, he wasn't doing any drugs. He wasn't drinking anything. He was just enjoying his family. Um, but I really saw a decline in him over the last year of his life. He started getting quiet, like really quiet, which wasn't like my dad at all. Um, and so as, as strange as this is to say, and I hope nobody takes it the wrong way, but when my dad passed away, there was a sense of relief. Because when you go through something with someone that has Alzheimer's, it's, you don't want them to live like that. You know what I mean? It's, um, does somebody have a little tissue? Sorry, makeup's gonna smear down my face. I didn't want my dad living like that. And I was relieved that he didn't have to live like that because he was still so strong. He could still bench press a crazy amount even the last couple weeks of his life. Two weeks before my dad passed away, he was working out with Hulk Hogan. Wow. But he was still so, so strong, but he wasn't like there anymore cognitively. So it was a relief to me, it was a relief to my family, and the very first person I called when my dad passed away was Vince McMahon. I was supposed to do a show that night, and I said to Vince, I said, I'm so sorry I can't do the show, my dad just died. And Vince was just like so wonderful. He really made sure that I always felt like I had a person to turn to, especially him, way outside of work. You know, I was always able to turn to him for that. And then four days later, after my dad's funeral, he want, Vince wanted me to like be there with Rhonda. So the day after I buried my dad, I made sure to be there for Rhonda at SummerSlam because I really wanted to be there for her. And like Vince knew that that would help get my mind off of things. So those moments though, I always like, I think my dad would have loved that ending, loved it. <clears throat> it's a tough business and you have thrived and, and you're a pioneer and I would strongly argue that there is no women's revolution, evolution, all the stuff that people want to say about the current state of women's wrestling without you. Uh, you are what you said Ronda was to MMA and uh, I hope you know that. And I'm just wondering, you know, you talk about... Thank you, Ariel. Uh, and, and it is the truth. Um, Sometimes you talk about your father and he, depression, anxiety. A lot of that probably came from the business, right? Because yes. it's tough, yeah. it's cutthroat. Do you deal with the same type of stuff? Have you dealt with that yeah. same type of stuff? Yeah, I have not dealt with the addiction side of it because I, I witnessed that growing up with my dad and my uncle, uh, Davey. It's just, it, it, watching them, it really scared me. So I was never like, never, you know, never dabbled in any of that. But I know what it's like to one minute, and, I, and I, now I understand, like I try to explain that to my sisters. I'm like, one minute you're in Madison Square Garden, sold out and you're winning the championships and everybody's on their feet. It's a feeling you can't explain. It's a feeling you can't bottle up. It's like the craziest high you could ever have. My dad had those high, high highs. You know, imagine being at WrestleMania two and your best friend is Andre the Giant and he pitched to have you as the last person in WrestleMania with him and, and Brett. Um, that happened because my dad and Andre were so close. Wow. And Andre loved Brett and my dad. So he said to Vince, he's like, I want them in, the, in at the end with me. My dad never ever stopped talking about that high in his life. And then you have these lows where you lose your job and your house gets repossessed and your, your, your house gets foreclosed on, your car gets repossessed. Um, like we lost everything and got everything so many times. We were like the richest kids in the neighborhood, the poorest kids in the neighborhood, the richest kids in the neighborhood, the poorest kids in the neighborhood. I mean, it was just a roller coaster all the time. And so for me, sometimes that like those little feelings creep back. And for me, like when I'm <laughs> wrestling Ronda Rousey at Money in the Bank and we're having such a, I'm on such a high up here or wrestling Becky Lynch in Toronto, opening up SummerSlam in front of 20,000 people and having one of the best matches of my career. Um, you know, walking out in front of 85,000 people this past year at WrestleMania, just these highs to these lows in the company where you're like not booked or you're not used right or you don't know why something is happening or you're, you're confused or you can't, there's no communication or you just feel this instability. That's entertainment. That's not just in WWE. 
you, that's not just in WWE, that's not just in AEW, that's not just in New Japan, that's in entertainment, that's in life. Highs, lows, highs, lows. But when you grow up around it as a kid and you have a very unstable, uh, like unsteady like childhood because of it, it, it just brings back childhood trauma. So I try, and I've been trying to work with a lot of girls in the locker room on this, take it one day at a time. When things are really, really great, enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Take it in, jump up and down, roll around in it, post about it, talk about it, love it you know, hug everybody extra tight, be happy, live in that moment, because we none of us know what tomorrow is gonna bring. Tomorrow isn't promised to anyone. You know, you could be on such a high, look at Roman Reigns, you know, when he was diagnosed with leukemia. It's like nobody could have seen that coming. And that's something Roman will have to deal with his, his entire life. You know, of course he's cancer free now, but going through something as serious as that, it's like nobody is exempt from going through really tough in their life whether it's John Cena, whether it's Roman Reigns, whether it's me. So I always tell the girls, I'm like, there's gonna be the highs and there's gonna be the lows. Save some of that feeling from the highs so that you can put it where, when you're feeling low. And because we're all gonna go through it, we're all kind of in it together. And um, it really helps when we can be able to lean on each other. Because I know that like mental health is a really big thing. It's not a cut we can see on our arm. Oh, you know, she's dealing with a mental health issue. Go into the trainer's room. No, people can't see mental health, but mental health is detrimental. And that's why like, I really like to be able to be there for the girls in the locker room because I've been through everything. Been through family deaths. You know, my uncle died in the ring. My, my other uncle, you know, like Davey, he passed away, not from wrestling, but just from, you know, from, you know, not being able to control pain management. You know, um, my dad, you know, he, he didn't die from wrestling. His was more genetic, but you know, when you go through these hard times and you see what people have sacrificed to make this what it is today for us, you know, enjoy things when they're good, but also don't beat yourself up when things don't make sense because my dad would always say, Natty, nobody remembers what happened last week. And I actually have texts saved from my dad where I'd be like, Daddy, I, I don't like what I was doing on the show today. I felt so stupid. I felt so insignificant. My dad would go, Natty, are you having fun? Like, are you, just make sure you're having fun. Nobody cares about who won or lost. Nobody cares about, he's like, you're remembering things that nobody else is gonna remember. My dad was the opposite of Brett. My dad didn't, like, he didn't take everything so seriously. And sometimes I love that about my dad, that he knew how to have fun. His, he loved going out and drinking with Andre the Giant after a show. Brett was like, we gotta make sure this match with the Bulldogs is amazing. And my dad's like, I'm just focused on the beer after with Andre. <laughs> <laughs> do you read those text messages a lot? Because I've seen you post screen grabs and you've just referenced. Like, do you go back and read your conversations with them a lot? So? I do. I actually have saved all my messages for, with my dad, the, all the ones that I could find. I go back and I read them a lot on planes. Like, if we have a long flight, I'll just go back and, like, my dad, uh, <laughs> he was so funny. He, he, like, he just always knew how to say the right thing. He always knew how to make things lighthearted. I do go back and read those. I took a ton of photos of my dad and I, too. He'd always get so... My dad would be like, Nanny, stop taking pictures. I'm like, no, I want to get like tons of photos. I love getting, getting pictures because I love being able to look back at memories, but I'm so glad now that I did. I got so many pictures with my dad. And so I love being able to look back on those times. And like, we did so many stupid things on Total Divas. My dad was just so funny on that show. He, he just cracked me up so much. How long do you want to do this for? How much longer? I just want to do it until the wheels fall off. <laughs> okay, so you don't have any, you don't, you're not saying till 50, till 45, you're just um, gonna go. I, I, I never, like, I feel like, here's my thing. I don't, I, knock on wood, I'm extremely durable. And it doesn't mean that injuries won't happen, they do, That's it's life. Whether you wrestle or not, injuries happen. Um, for me, I feel like I just, my, my body feels so good. I feel like I wake up every day, and I know this is crazy for a pro wrestler, but I wake up every day virtually pain-free. I don't know if that's because of my dad's genetics. My dad was just like a superhuman as far as just being strong, strong bones, strong tendons, super genetics. Um, I wake up and I feel really, really good. I'm like, I don't have knee pain, I don't have shoulder pain, I don't have neck pain. I, I feel ridiculously good for, for a girl that's had the most professional wrestling matches of any woman in the history of the entire industry. Wow. Not just in WWE, like there's no woman that has had as many matches as me. No one. So that's why I have the most wins. That's why I have the most losses. That's why I have the most pay-per-view matches. That's why I have the most WrestleMania matches, the most Money in the Bank matches, because I've just been super, super consistent. Uh, I take really, really good care of myself, but I will not do it anymore if it's not fun. So the second that it stops being fun consistently where I'm just not enjoying myself, I feel like, you know, that's when you'll know. 
and I feel like you gotta trust the signs of the universe. I don't wanna be somebody that's wrestling when their body is broken um, or not able to move or not able to be the natty that people would expect. But I always feel like wrestling's like Hotel California. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave, it never leaves you. Being, being in WWE, I know that, and I have enough insight to know that this will be the most special stuff I'll ever do in my entire career. Like no matter what I do in the world, anywhere after this, it'll never compare to this. It'll never compare to how cool this job is. From traveling around the entire world, meeting people from every walk of life, especially kids that are dying of, of terminal illnesses that are relying on you for inspiration. That, you know, we do stuff like that where we actually go to these children's hospitals and visit these incredible kids and the doctors will tell us like, you, you guys raise their vitals. Like when you come in, you give them hope. It gives them hope to like live longer. To, to be able to do that is like beyond powerful. To, to, to do stuff like that. And then to be able to like have these incredible matches with fans around the world and people in every corner of the world know who you are and connect with you. I feel like I've got people and family in every corner in Japan and Australia and New Zealand. Like everybody from a corner knows me and I could like adapt in any place because of what WWE has given me. Um, I feel like I'll always be a part of it. I look at even like Chris Jericho and I'm like, Chris is like, I would love, I, he really inspires me in so many ways. One, I love his promos. I get a lot of inspiration from Chris Jericho's promos, but he's always reinventing himself. And he's always doing stuff to make sure that others around him are elevated. And that's the thing is that whenever I go in to pitch an idea to Vince McMahon, because at the end of the day, he is the guy that we pitch to, I always make sure to, to, to pitch stuff that's gonna elevate other people. And that's why I think that Vince has always been so receptive to my ideas because even if he doesn't go with them or he doesn't agree with them, which has happened many times, he knows that I'm not gonna go in it for myself. I wanna go, how can we make the story amazing? How can we elevate everyone? And, and for several WrestleManias in a row, I know it was like online somewhere and I, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that got out. But um, I had the last two, three WrestleManias, the, girl, the matches that I was in, I, I pitched to have those matches. I said, I want there to be more women on the show. There needs to be more women on the show. I said, we, we can't have a locker room full of girls that aren't working. It's gonna be hard on their morale. It's gonna be hard for the girls to all go to WrestleMania and not be included. Mm -hmm. I know you've got the Bianca Sasha match. I know you've got the, the Charlotte Ronda match, but what about the other girls? And Vince has been super receptive to like making sure that there's been even more inclusion because he knows that I'm not just about like, I wanna, you know, I wanna leave this business better than when I started it. I wanna be able to help women at every single corner, women that are being pushed, women that are about to get a push, women that are about to break through, and women that haven't gotten a chance. I wanna make sure that I help every single woman that I can help, and then I leave here better than, it, than when I found it. Last thing, is there anything that you haven't done yet? I mean, I feel like you've pretty much done it all. You've won belts, tag team, all that, that you haven't done, that you would love to do before you know, the end comes. I wanna main event WrestleMania. And that's something that I haven't done and I would absolutely love to do. Um, of course, we now have had several women's matches main event WrestleMania. Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. Breathtaking, breathtaking match. That match made me want, I wanna be in the main event of WrestleMania. I wanna be better than them. It brought out really a competitive side to me that I was like, I wanna have, I said to Sasha after the match, I was like, I wanna like have a match like that at WrestleMania. Um, it just was super inspiring. Both girls, again, bringing their heart. You can teach a lot of things to people. You can teach people how to do drop kicks. You can te teach people how to do headlocks. You can't teach heart and you can't teach passion. It's, it's just, it's, it's something that Brett has said this before. It's something that's in you from the beginning. And it's something that money cannot buy and that can't be taught. But I felt that in those performances. You are such an inspiration. You, you make me proud to be a pro wrestling fan. You make me proud to be Canadian. You're such a great role model. You've had an incredible run. I can't wait till you main event WrestleMania. I love you. that you said that so confidently right off the bat there. Uh, you deserve that. You really do. And uh, you've had such an incredible run. And uh, it's really an honor to sit with you considering what you've done, considering who your family is. I think I've told you when I was a little kid going to the doctor, I used to, they, my mom, did I ever tell you this? My, my mom would say I was scared of needles when I was maybe seven or eight. And my mom would say, close your eyes and think of something that makes you happy. And I would think of Brett winning the, the, the title. That's what made me happy. That's so, so funny. Yes, he was my favorite athlete. Like, I love that man. And I uh, loved your dad also. So it's just an honor for me. And thank you so much for I sharing I love that because I can tell that you're a student of the game. And I think that, like, it's just so cool that when real, recognize real.
Amen. Thank you so Thank much. You, Ariel. Congrats on a great career Thank thus you. far, and I can't wait to see what you do for the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> Natalia Neidhart, Ariel Hawani meets. What a legend. What an honor. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.